We're in Romans chapter 10 again this week, so if you'll join me there, we'll begin reading in verse 14 in just a moment. And we're going to be dealing with a subject this morning that changed my life. Thinking back, I was trying to remember the timeline this week and and even looking back through some of the sermons that I preached when God was doing a work in my heart. The end of 2011, early 2012, it's kind of a when God began the process to help me reimagine what discipleship looked like in the church, and that started with a couple of books that I read. One was "Who Stole My Church." Uh, Brother Dwayne gave me that that book, and that got me thinking about church in biblical terms. And then some writings by David Platt. But it, it, um, it got me thinking about discipleship and really thinking about what it means to carry out the Great Commission. Because before Jesus ascended back to heaven to take his rightful place at the right hand of the Father, he told us to go and to make disciples of all nations. To teach them everything that he had commanded us and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit And he made a promise that as we did that, as we went and did that, he would be with us until the end of the age. It's in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. All four Gospels record some uh, evidence of that call to go and tell, that call to go and make disciples. It even appears in Acts chapter 1, 8, the beginning of the record of the New Testament church, where the promise is given to them that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and that they would be witnesses for Jesus starting in their hometown unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And, and that's how, the, how this carries out. And so I, would, I say all of that to say this. Our text in Romans chapter 10, I believe, is Paul's effort through the Holy Spirit to relate that calling to the church in Rome. I believe what we read in verses 14 and onward with simple, progressive logic and many Old Testament references, he's simply laying out how they, as a New Testament church, carry out the Great Commission. How we then, by readers of this sacred text, are also to do the same. And so let's let's read the text together. Look with me at verse 14. Romans chapter 10, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And so we're kind of unpacking verse 13, right? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? You kind of, I hope you're tracking with me now, and I hope you sense the parallels between what we just read in verses 14 and 15 and what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, telling us to go and tell. Let's, let's finish reading the text. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing... In hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? So Paul still has Israel on his mind. First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me, and I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and to a contrary people. And so with this simple, progressive logic, Paul lays out the facts of their calling to go and tell. And it starts in verse 13. Only those who call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. And only those who believe in him can call upon him. And only those who have heard of him can believe in him. And only those who have a preacher can hear of him. And only those who are sent by God will go and tell others of the good news. Now, that stands to reason. There's a process laid out for us there. And by the way, that logic works both ways. Let's let's look at it in reverse. 
If God didn't send messengers, then no one could hear. Isn't that true? Someone had to come and tell you, didn't they? That was the case for me. If God didn't send any messengers, then no one can hear. And if no one could hear, then no one could believe. And if no one could believe, then no one could call upon the name of the Lord. And without calling upon the name of the Lord, no one can be saved. You see how the logic works? And so as we read that text, a process is laid out for us about how God saves people. And then as we're looking at that process, I think we uncover a problem as well. And so let's talk about the process, verses 14 and 15 and verse 17. We've already kind of laid this out, but let's talk about how God saves people. Calling upon the name of the Lord requires faith. And so that's how this process begins in order in the text. Calling upon the name of the Lord requires faith. Please hear me on this. It stands to reason that no one will call upon somebody if they don't first believe that that somebody can save. For instance, you have a flat tire on the roadside on the way home. You're going down Interstate 49, and you're booking it with the flow of traffic, and your tire blows out, and you pull off to the side just in time to escape that car coming up on you at 80 miles an hour. You're a member of, member of AAA, and so you get your phone out, and you make a phone call. But, but here's my point. You're not going to call AAA for roadside assistance if you don't believe that that person is going to come, right? You're not going to do it because you, you will not make that call unless you believe somebody is going to come to your aid, right? You're not going to call me, <laughs> right, or someone else to come to your aid and help you get at that tire and on, on your car and get you on your way unless you believe first that that person is going to come to your aid. The same is true with regard to the gospel. If I don't believe that Jesus is the Savior, I'm never going to call on him, right? If I, I, if I don't believe that Jesus can somehow redeem me and save me and forgive me from my sins, then I'm never going to call on him. And that's the point that Paul is making here. It seems elementary, this process, but if you don't believe first that Jesus can forgive you, you're never going to ask for forgiveness. Does that make sense? And so calling upon the Lord requires faith. Second, believing in the Lord requires hearing. Faith comes by, by hearing. And, and this, by the way, is as simple, I think, as possible. Before you can believe in somebody, you have to have at least heard of that person. Right? How are you going to call AAA if you don't even know there's a AAA? How are you going to call upon Jesus if you don't even know there's a Jesus. Before you can believe in Jesus, you have to have at least heard of Jesus. The, the truth has to be heard before it can take root and become transformative. And that stands to reason, doesn't it? So, so calling upon the Lord requires faith. Believing in the Lord requires hearing. And then hearing the word of Christ requires preaching. Someone has to go and tell. And so we're going to park here for a minute. I went through those first two pretty quickly, but let's park here for a minute. Because calling on the Lord doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, it doesn't happen spontaneously. It doesn't happen by intuition or mystical experience or through meditation or speculation or philosophy or some kind of cultural consensus Calling upon the name of the Lord comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The saving word of Christ has to be proclaimed. You understand? You have had to have heard before you can be saved. That's how that works. That, that in the mind of God, God has prescribed this process and how he will save people. People have to hear the word. The Holy Spirit has to draw them before they can ever believe in Christ. And so the saving word of Christ must be proclaimed. And there's an excellent illustration of this in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, the New Testament church is in full swing. They've ordained some deacons. And for a couple of chapters after chapter 6, the, 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 the writer of Acts is focusing on the ministry of those deacons. They're getting after it. And Philip is one of those guys. And in verse 26, Philip is sent into the desert on a mission. 
And, and there on a desert road, by the Holy Spirit he's sent there, he meets up with an Ethiopian eunuch who's an official from the court of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He's returning to Ethiopia from Jerusalem. He had gone there to worship for one of the worship festivals on the religious calendar if you're a Jew. So he's obviously a, a proselyte to Judaism somehow. He's a, a, so, somehow he's seeking the Lord. And under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Philip runs up alongside of his chariot and finds that official reading from the prophet Isaiah. He's reading out loud. He hears it. And under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch answers, how can I unless somebody helps me? And so he's reading it, not understanding what he's reading. He's wondering who the, the writer, who Isaiah is writing about. Is he writing about himself or is he writing about someone else? And so he invites Philip up to come and sit with him in his chariot and a conversation begins. And the Bible says that Philip begins to explain from that scripture the good news about Jesus. That Philip, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, seizes upon this God-ordained moment and explains to him Jesus, he has to tell him what that scripture means in order for that man to believe because the man is left in his misunderstanding. And so the man believes and he's baptized straight away. And, and here's the point of that illustration. That man could not be saved in that vacuum. Right? Someone had to go and tell. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. The saving word of Christ has to be proclaimed for people to be saved. And so let me say just a word quickly then about something that has been popular for several decades now, and that is it's called lifestyle evangelism, where people take the approach that, that all you need to do is live out the faith in front of others, and it's enough, that your good example is enough. And, and, and let me say this, it's absolutely necessary. That, that, that approach is absolutely necessary. We, we are called upon by Jesus, Matthew 5, 15 and 16, to let our lights shine before men because we're the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world, just like he sent us into the world to be so that people see our good works and they glorify our Father who is in heaven. It's absolutely necessary, but it's not a substitute for the proclaimed word of Christ. It's not enough. Your good example is not enough to save people in the same way that as creation testifies of the Godhead and his power and his glory, that's not enough to save people either. It's enough to lead people into a seeking relationship with Christ, but not a saving one. You understand? And so it's necessary, but it's not a substitute. And so please hear me on this. The impact of the gospel is greatly diminished when people who claim the name of Jesus live unholy lives. So it's important that we be salt and light. It's important that we live out the faith in front of others so that they see it and they give glory to our Father in heaven. Equally true is that the gospel impact is diminished by the silence of those who claim to believe it. Are you with me on that? That, 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 that the impact of the gospel among your family and your coworkers, and your neighborhood, and your friends is greatly diminished when we are silent. So th listen to me. We are counseled by the scriptures to always be ready to give an answer, to speak with our mouths, to go and tell. Always be ready to give an answer of the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15. The saving word of Christ has to be proclaimed for people to be saved. Are you with me on that? And so when we're putting all this together, calling upon the Lord requires faith, Believing in the Lord requires hearing. Hearing the word of Christ requires preaching. And then next, preaching the word of Christ requires sending. Verse 15. That, that if our top priority, according to the Great Commission, is to go and make disciples, preaching is how that gets done. Somebody has to go and tell, then we must make preaching, the proclamation of the gospel, the top priority of the church. So much so that we as the body of Christ must be committed to sending preachers and missionaries 
to preach the gospel to all people everywhere. That it isn't just about Springdale or Northwest Arkansas or Arkansas for that matter. And it's not just about America for that matter. It's about the uttermost parts of the earth. Everyone needs to hear. And that, that, by the way, is a monumental task, isn't it? In a world of seven plus billion people. According to the Joshua Project, there are 17,473 people groups on planet Earth. And, and with that comes many different spoken languages. Of those 17,473 people groups, 7,441 are unreached, which means they have zero gospel witness. That they do not have the word of God in their, their language, that there is no missionary enterprise, that they remain unreached. 7,441 people groups on planet Earth. So, so let's put that in, in different terms. That means that out of our 7 billion people population, 42.6% or 3.24 billion people have never heard the name of Jesus. What about them? What about them? 3.2 billion people. Now, I realize that when, when you start talking about numbers that large, we're in danger of just turning that into a statistic, and we don't actually see that as 3.2 billion souls for whom Christ died. We don't see that as 3.2 billion people who will spend eternity in hell, separated from God forever, and they never had a chance to hear the name of Jesus. This is important, loved ones. I hope you agree that, that eternity hangs in the balance. And so I think it's at this point that we start to do a little mental gymnastics. That, that we're trying to convince ourselves that this doesn't apply to us because we've not been called to be a preacher or a missionary. And, and, and God hasn't called me to do that. God hasn't called me to go to a foreign field. And, and, and we're worried about the ramifications of that, that if we decide that we're going to do this and partner with God in his, his enterprise to reach the nations with the gospel, then that may mean we end up in Africa or South America and somewhere in the jungle, and, and, and we don't want that. What, please hear me. When we start doing backflips in our minds trying to massage this and convince ourselves that we've never been called to be a missionary either, God hasn't called me to be a preacher, it may be true, but only in part, not the whole. Because here's the deal. When you received the gospel of Jesus Christ, you also received with that a call to go and to make disciples. The two go hand in hand. They are not to be separated. And that as a part of the body of Christ, when you, when you received the gospel of Christ, then you became a part of the body of Christ, you also with that shouldered the responsibility to send those who are called into the world. And so at the, at the very least... We're responsible to do some sending, even though maybe we haven't been called, right? Personally, then, every single one of us, if we receive the gospel, shares in the responsibility then to also be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ, that God sends us like he did the maniac of Gadara after he had delivered him from a legion of demons, and he wanted to go with Jesus and be part of his missionary team. Jesus sent him back home to his family and friends to tell them of all the good things he had done for him. And at the very least, listen to me. As a believer of Jesus, God has sent you back to your family and to your friends to tell of the good things he has done for you. Amen? And so having received the gospel, we have received the call to go and tell. And so while missionaries are sent to their fields of service and and preachers mount their platforms and proclaim the word, you, having been sent back to your family and to your friends, will go where they never go. Did you know that? It compounds the influence and increases the impact of the gospel when this happens. If we leave it up to only those who are called to a foreign field 
or only those who stand behind some kind of pulpit or a lectern or sit on a stool like I am doing, then the gospel impact is limited, isn't it? But if we all shoulder this responsibility to go and tell, to go back to our family, to go back to our friends, then that, that gospel impact is exponentially increased because you go where they will never go. You will, you will meet people that they will never meet. And that's the beauty of it. Tomorrow morning when you go to work, you're going to talk to people that I will never, ever meet, ever. And, and, and that's your responsibility, to go and tell people who your preacher will never meet. And that, that you, you, when you go back to, you, to your neighborhood, that you're going to be surrounded by people, whether it's an apartment or a house or wherever it is that you live, that there, there's somebody that lives within proximity to you that, that a missionary like Josh Provo, who is in Bulgaria, will, will never, ever, ever be near. Because God didn't send him there. God sent him there, right? And so you have the responsibility to go and tell him. And, and this, this works in every circle and in every arena of our lives. You will contact people that missionaries never will, and you will contact people that preachers never will. So for the sake of the gospel, I am pleading with you and praying that you sense this calling to go and to tell because faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And they will never hear. They will never hear unless somebody is sent unless somebody goes and tells, right? Now, that's the process, how God saves people. In his, in his sovereign omnipotence, that is how God has determined that the church will carry out the gospel in the world. But as we talk about the process, looking back at the text, we also uncover some problems. And, that, and, and I want to enumerate two of them for you. Because you know as well as I do that we get our hopes up sometimes. But here's the deal. Not all who hear believe. We know that from verse 16, right? Again, Paul has the nation of Israel on his mind. He's been on his mind since chapter 9. And, 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 and focusing again on the nation of Israel, the Apostle Paul, quoting from three different Old Testament passages, Psalm 19, Deuteronomy 32, and Isaiah 65, he starts helping us understand that, that as we go and tell, not everybody who hears will believe. Everybody that I've told about the gospel, I'm not, I'm not batting a thousand on that one. You know, it, as a matter of fact, if I, if I understand the words of Jesus that many are called but few are chosen, then, you know, I'm pretty low on the list but that's that's not the point the point is that we don't reach everybody that we go and tell the point is that we go and tell god saves we don't you know that right god saves we don't we just are responsible to go and to tell and so when we look at israel their rejection of christ as savior was not based upon a lack of knowledge. That, that their unbelief was because they didn't know. It wasn't because of, of a lack of truth. That, that they, as Jesus said in John 5, 39, they would search the scriptures thinking that in the scriptures they would find eternal life, but in the, the scriptures were actually testifying about Christ. And so in all of their intellectual pursuits, they missed Messiah. So the same truth is emphasized, I think, for us in chapter 1. And I'm inviting you to think back to many, many months ago now when we talked about verses 18 through 20 in regards to all people. That, that God has, has given people the witness of creation and their own conscience. And those two things put together are enough for him to hold every single person accountable and that the light of Jesus has come into the world, and that light, according to John chapter 1, lights every man. So much so that God righteously and justly holds all people everywhere at all times accountable for the light they've received. And that from the very beginning of creation, his invisible attributes Things like his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen and understood through the witness of creation. 
And so please hear me on what, this is what that means. Those who refuse to seek him do so because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, not for a lack of it. Those who refuse to seek God do so because they suppress the truth, they keep it down, they bottle it up, they refuse to be impacted by it, they reject it, not because they don't know it, not because they don't understand it, it's because they suppress it in unrighteousness and God holds them accountable. But with that also, listen to me, comes this gracious promise from the prophet Jeremiah 600 years before Christ was born. That you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. You will find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's Jeremiah 29, 13. So this is the absolute assurance to all people everywhere that no person who sincerely seeks for God will fail to find him. So then, very simply, to fail to find him is a refusal to believe. And as I said a moment ago, we're responsible to go and tell. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to believe. Some people will suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They will, instead of responding to the truth of the gospel, instead, they will go out and revel in the daytime and take pleasure in those who revel with them suppressing the truth that they receive in their unrighteousness. Not because of a lack of knowledge, right? They simply refuse to believe. And yet in light of that, if what I'm reading is correct, reports that we're hearing from the Middle East, that, that people who have, who have only know the name of Jesus, they don't know how God saves people, they've simply heard the name of Jesus, that they are turning to the faith because they believe because they've received some light and they're seeking the light and they're finding God because they are searching for him with all their heart. And that's the promise. We know not everybody who hears will believe, but everybody who seeks for the Lord with all their heart will not fail to find him. Amen? Second problem is that not all who are sent will go. And I think this is probably more to our point this morning, and I, I realize that I might be making an assumption from the text, but I believe it's a safe one. I think it's certainly one that's applicable concerning the responsibility that we share to go and tell. Now, I, I, want, I want to be clear on this, that, that we, we have responsibility to go and tell as individual believers, as a church, I would say even as our denomination, the enterprise of our denomination, churches come together so that they can increase the influence of the gospel around the world, right? We share that responsibility. In light of that, though, God is sovereign and in complete control over salvation. That, that he is sovereign over its means and its end. He is sovereign, complete control over how it gets done and what it accomplishes. That, that he's sovereign over its extension that he is sovereign how he himself extends grace and mercy into the world, how it's received, who receives it. God's sovereign over all of that. And so, but hear me on this. Intrinsic to God's eternal plan and sovereign plan of salvation is my obedient faith and yours. That in order to produce salvation in people, God's free grace warrants a positive response people have to believe and as god is sovereign over all of it we still have to respond and and that loved ones is why i'm a free will baptist right there because i believe in an open call of the gospel that whosoever will may come and that if somebody hears the word of god through the work of the holy spirit they can be saved no matter who they are and no matter where they are and I think that's the responsibility that we have here. Anyone who hears the word of God through the drawing of the Holy Spirit can, can follow Christ. But, but even though God is sovereign over all of it, his free grace warrants a positive response for us. So God has made people responsible for their choices, right? 
They're responsible for, for their choice of faith or unbelief. They're, they're responsible for what they do with the information that they receive. In the same way, I set all of that to set this up, in the same way he has made you and I responsible to share the treasure that we have received. That as God is sovereign over the gospel, and God is sovereign over who gets saved and when and how and what he's going to produce in them, God has also sovereignly determined that the gospel will go forward. The kingdom of Christ will be built on earth during this dispensation through the obedience of people that he has redeemed. That the gospel goes forward when you and I decide we're going to obey. That when we, and God has therefore made us responsible for the treasure that we have received. And so that means then the people who comprise the church must be witnesses. Both, both right here where we live, but also in the uttermost parts of the world. And, and God hasn't sent me to Bulgaria like Josh Provo or to, to Japan like the Carnies or to France, like the Reeves, God has sent me to northwest Arkansas, and I'm, I'm responsible to make disciples here. But, but though I'm here, right here, making disciples, I can still have an impact in Japan because of what I'm doing here. You understand? That, that you, right now, through your obedience impacting northwest Arkansas, building the kingdom right here from your family, from your friends, from your neighbors, from, from your coworkers, that you can impact what goes on with Josh Provo in Bulgaria through your prayers and through your financial support and through your faithful obedience right here because the kingdom marches on and Jesus promised that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Satan doesn't win. He doesn't. Satan doesn't win. Jesus does. And so please hear me as we wrap this up. And boy, you're getting out early today. I preached way too fast. When we put all this together, we understand the task ahead of us. And we begin to sense the reality of what we're up against and our responsibility in the world that we live in. I want to ask you if you will simply go. That, and, and I realize what this means. In a congregation this size, that there may be someone here, and, 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 and we need not simply limit it to the young people who haven't figured out what they want to do with their lives. God calls people who are in the midst of careers all the time to leave what they know and the safety of their comfort zones to go and tell somebody in the uttermost parts of the earth. That, that God may be calling you to do something like that. And, and no, I don't want to lose you. I love you, and I love, I love the fact that you're part of our body here, and I, I, I kind of want to gather the chicks under the, you know, in the nest and keep everybody safe. But you know what? That's not how the kingdom works. That if, if the gospel is going to go forward, then someone's going to have to be obedient to go. That, that there, are, there are billions of people, 3.2 four billion people that have never heard the name of Jesus and, and that in and of itself demands that somebody go right and, and it also means that sometimes I think some things got to change in the way that we live and, that, that, and I, I I'm going to speak personally I get so wrapped up in what I know and what I'm doing taking my kids to school and preparing for the sermon on Sunday and going about my business, that I miss the people. When I'm going from point A to point B, I'm missing the people that I'm passing along the way. And I get so wrapped up in my stuff, and I'm so in love with my stuff, that, that I forget that, that, that my life does not consist of the abundance of my possessions, and that, that there is more to this life than just what I know right now. And so, God, please help me, as I commit to go, not to waste my life on stuff, or just checking off things on my to-do list. Help me to live in light of eternity. And so when I'm asking you to be willing to go, I'm, I'm talking about those things. And that maybe, maybe God is beginning to stir in you a desire to go and tell one of those unreached people groups. That maybe God is working in you to live simply in 
forsake the things of this world so that you can live in light of eternity and not waste your life. And maybe he is simply calling you to go and tell your coworkers. I think maybe that's generally more true. That, that there are somebody you work with that needs to hear from you. Or somebody in your neighborhood that could could hear from you. And I'm thinking about my neighborhood, and I'm ashamed. I know my immediate neighbors, but but past one door down on each side, I don't know anybody in my neighborhood. And yeah, I come out into the street, and when I'm getting the mail, and we talk to our neighbors across the street, Brad and Julie, and we talk to, to Brian uh, uh, on the other side of them, and I don't talk to them, but I past that, I don't know them. And I see some of them leaving when we leave, and I assume maybe just by looking at the way that they're dressed that they're going to church, but I don't know that. And so I, God may be sending me back there. You know, it'd be amazing what a dozen fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies could do, soften somebody's heart for the gospel, right? Cookies for Jesus. And, you know, there's, we have family and friends need to hear from us. And, and I'm, I'm praying, and I prayed all week that we would sense this responsibility that that one person that we're all thinking about right now, that, that we would start there. That, that it, and instead of starting big and thinking about going to Africa somewhere and getting scared out of our wits and deciding that that's not for us, that we would, that we would see that one person's face and that we would call their name in prayer. And that we would shoulder the responsibility to go and tell that one person. We'd start there. And so, will you, will you do that? Will you, as I pray in just a moment, will you be willing to commit to start right there? And, and then even more than that, that you be, be ready. That, that you did just decide when you leave the house in the morning, that I would decide when I leave the house in the morning, that I'm going to be ready, that I'm going to be on my guard, that I'm going to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be walking by faith, and I'm going to be sensitive to what's going on around me. I'm not just going to blindly go about my day from task to task and point to point, but I'm going to be ready to give somebody an answer of the hope that rests within me with gentleness and respect when they ask, because I'll make you a promise. that If you're ready and you're paying attention, the opportunity will come. It 100% will. And so let's, let's not neglect that in all of this either. Let's, let's, let's partner with God by faith in his plan to save people and be willing to go and tell. Amen, church? Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us to focus through the Holy Spirit. And that we would, we would stop the mental gymnastics and the fear about what this might look like long term. That, that we wouldn't be caught up in the fear of rejection before we've ever gone. That you would help us to focus. And that you would help us to see that one person. And that we, right now, as we're praying together in the Spirit, we would call their name in prayer. Lord, help me to go and tell them of the good news of Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And so help me and my brothers and sisters to go and tell. Help us to start there. And Lord, I pray that, that if, if we'd be willing to be obedient right there in that one point this week that you would help us to prepare our hearts to be ready to go and tell that you would give us some wins. We know not everybody who hears will believe, but Lord, I pray that you would help us to see some wins, that you would help us to see your kingdom being built through our faithful obedience this week, that the people we invite to church this week would come or the people we invite to small group this week would come, the people that we will ask if we can pray with them, that they would accept that gracious offer and we could pray with them 
and that someone would believe because we decided we would go and tell. Father, may your will be done in us just as it is in heaven. And I pray that you would increase our faith in Jesus' name.